John Cochran and I welcome you all to another meeting of the Economic Policy Working Group. And we're just delighted to have Christina Skinner uh, join us today. And she's, gonna, she's a professor at Wharton School, of course, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, an expert in financial regulation. And she knows a lot about central banking and not only the US, but the Bank of England having worked there. So we appreciate our perspective. The title is very much in the news, very important to get figured out called Central Bank and Climate Change. So Christina, why don't you go ahead? There'll be lots of questions and answers. I think you'd prefer to speak a little bit, but maybe questions uh, will come up as we go. But uh, thank you so much for joining us and we're looking forward to your, your talk. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'll get my slides going and um, take it away. Let's see, here we go. Um, so again, thanks so much for the, for the opportunity to speak to the group. I mean, this is a tremendous opportunity for me to talk about a constellation of projects that I've been working on in the past two years that have really been sort of critically examining the really what I see an as an increasing appetite for a more political form of central banking. So I added that little descriptor to the title there and, you know, commensurate with that in some quarters, sort of this waning interest in central bank independence or this waning um, commitment to central bank independence. And the issue of climate change, sort of just to put it in context, has you know, in some ways, I think really catalyzed this trend in central banking philosophy or, you know, pathology, depending on how you see it, which, you know, may well only be the tip of the iceberg right now. So in my time today speaking, and I'll speak, I have speak for about 30 minutes. Um, I really want to use climate change as an, a case study to motivate a conversation about this broader phenomenon of what I've elsewhere referred to as central bank activism, and also to try and wrestle with the political economy around the incentives also growing in the executive branch to try and capture the power of the Fed. So I want to first sort of very briefly give you a little bit more context around this issue and how I've been thinking about it and writing about it. Then I'll use most of my time to get into the weeds about the Fed and central banks and climate change and the meets and bounds of legal authority there. And then I want to conclude with some discussion of the risks that I see to the integrity of the Fed as an institution and the quality of its policy decisions, which as I'm going to suggest are again sort of manifest in the issue of climate change but will continue to arise in connection with various efforts to move the Fed in new directions, sort of maybe outside of its lane, so to speak. So, you know, today the very notion of what a central bank is, is very much contested and probably more so than any other time since the Fed's founding in 1913 or its revamp in 1935. So today, what I find is that when you ask the question of experts in the field, and I'll say especially legal experts, you get very, very different answers to the question of what is the Fed supposed to do? And the fundamental divide is among those that believe that central banks are monetary institutions in the first instance. They're responsible for maintaining price and economic stability. And those that really see the central bank, the Fed especially, as, as a kind of shapeshifter that can morph to address whatever problems that some segment of society believes is important for the Fed to address. And so for many, increasingly, the Fed is the answer to everything that has some economic valence. And so the Fed and other leading central banks are being asked to deploy their policy tools to address climate change, yes, but also to address social problems like inequality, financial inclusion, and you know, to even increase payments efficiency for everyday citizens. And the list will no doubt grow. So, you know, in other words, the Fed is really being asked to use its policy tools to do more and more economic engineering. And of course, climate change has been the most prominent example of this view that the Fed should try and affect the direction and the flow of capital 
in a way that isn't value or market neutral, but is in the service of a particular structural view of what the economy should look like. And in this case, a greener economy. And the Fed certainly is not alone here. So central banks around the world have been asked to think about, have been asked to address climate change. And a number of the world's leading central banks have really leaned in to this call. So we had Christine Lagarde at the ECB who has referred to climate change as mission critical to the ECB. And she said that she'll explore every avenue in the fight against climate change. And to that end, the ECB has come up with some new policy innovations. They've pioneered a green bond buying program, what's sometimes commonly referred to as green QE, and they're experimenting with climate scenarios and stress tests. Mark Carney also really moved the needle in this direction while he was the governor of the Bank of England. So Mark Carney was one of the first to expand the definition of financial stability risk to include climate risk. And this in turn sort of was the trigger for expanding their stress testing framework. And so now the Bank of England has embarked on an exploratory version of a stress testing scenario specific for climate. And then finally, there have been multiple calls to increase capital requirements for certain kinds of brown assets, maybe through the Basel regime, maybe unilaterally, again, to affect banks incentives to lend to certain industries and not others. Now, for a while, the Fed was pretty measured in its approach to this mounting conversation around climate change at the central bank. However, in the face of tremendous international, public, and presidential pressure, the Fed has started to dip its toe in the waters, so to speak. So I'll give you a quick timeline of how the Fed has evolved in its response to climate change. So in November of 2020, this was sort of the first indication that the Fed was maybe getting into the game, it issued a financial stability report suggesting that it might be willing to characterize climate change as a financial stability risk. And this is really important trigger for policy action, which I'll get into a little bit later. In December of 2020, the Fed finally, after several years of sort of abstaining, the Fed joined the Network for Greening the Financial System, which, as I'm sure most of you know, is a consortium of central banks that, as the name would suggest, is dedicated to using central bank policy tools to effectuate a greener economy. In March of last year, the Fed stood up two supervisory committees, one on the microprudential side of things and one on the macroprudential side of things, to basically study how climate change might impact the Fed's mandate, thereby creating a foundation for policy action. And then lastly, the Fed has also received and is responding to instructions from the Financial Stability Oversight Council to further reflect on how to address climate change. And I'll return to most of these innovations throughout the course of my remarks. So many of the calls on the Fed to address climate change have been grounded in some key assertions, okay? That climate change is a financial stability risk. That climate change will impact price stability and employment. That banks are not prepared for climate change. But these statements, as I'm trying to express in this work and others, they don't supply legal authority for the Fed to do anything. We need to actually interrogate the text and the structure, the history and the purpose of the Fed's mandates in a variety of ways to to really get to the bottom of what the Fed can and cannot do. You know, after all, we are a society bound by the rule of law. The Fed is an agent of Congress. So whatever the Fed has, whatever space it has to work is a really a legal question in the first instance. I think it's really also important to emphasize, and I'll flesh this out as I go on, we're, we're really dealing with a relative legal question here as well. So climate change has, of course, inspired global conversations, and it's framed, and it is a global issue. But there is no uniform international law of central banking. And relative to other central banks that have gone quite far in this space, like the Bank of England and the ECB, 
the Fed, as I'll explain, has very limited legal authority to proactively act in the space of climate change. And so a big part of what I'm doing is try and add some discipline to this interpretive exercise to be very concrete about what we're asking the Fed to do while taking each of the Fed's specific functions in view to again, sketch out, to scope the meets and bounds of the Fed's legal authority and to sort of remind and continuously bring up in the conversation that these lane markers have ultimately been set by Congress. So first we can consider the Fed's monetary policy powers as we're sort of going through the assortment of functions and powers that the Fed has. So the question is, you know, what can the Fed do in respect of climate change? And the Fed's balance sheet is, of course, very powerful. So a lot of focus is on these monetary policy functions of the Fed and other central banks. Now, in the first place, the Fed can certainly react to climate related shocks. It has various so-called lender of last resort powers, both in regard to its discount window lending in section 10B of the Federal Reserve Act, and also in respect of the emergency liquidity facilities that it stands up. Now these functions and powers of the Fed, you know, legally, they're completely agnostic as to the cause of a shock. So the Fed can always react to any macroeconomic shock that impairs its ability to achieve its dual mandate. But there's very limited authority, if any, in contrast, to go on the offensive with balance sheet tools to try and move the economy to a greener place. So things like green quantitative easing, basically using the balance sheet to buy green bonds, along the lines of what has been done and experimented in the Bank of England and the ECB, it's really not an option legally for the Fed. And there are two reasons for that. So the first reason is because there are very real limits in the Federal Reserve Act in regard to what the Fed can buy in the open market when it engages in open market operations. So the reserve banks can buy a few things that are specifically set out in the Federal Reserve Act, gold, US government debt, of course, agency debt, muni debt, but they can't buy private bonds under Section 14 of the Federal Reserve Act, whether they're green, brown, pink, purple, or otherwise. That's just not on the table. Secondly, there is quite a narrow and specific monetary policy mandate in Section 2A of the Federal Reserve Act, right? It refers to maximum employment and price stability. However, it's a stretch to tie price stability to climate change events right now. The Fed's monetary policy, it might trail developments in the economy, but it has never, and Congress never intended it to chase or anticipate changes to the price level along a very long time horizon. Arguably, Congress just did not delegate the Fed the power to do that. Now, what's interesting is you can contrast what you have in Europe and the UK in the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union and the Bank of England Act. So in regard to the ECB, you can see that the ECB actually has as part of its legal mandate a requirement that the ECB take in view the environmental goals of the union when it's fashioning its monetary policy. The Bank of England has a similar so-called secondary mandate. The MPC is must have regard to the economic policy of government. So this means that HMT, Her Majesty's Treasury, has the power to specify for the Bank of England, for the MPC, what the government's goals are. And it did, in fact, do that in regard to climate in 2021. So in 2021, the annual remit letter, rather than just sort of specifying, you know, 2% inflation targeted, it went further and said, we also want you to have regard to sustainability when you're engaging in your asset purchases. So in contrast to the United States and the Federal Reserve, both the Bank of England and the ECB have this legal authority to pursue what is a policy goal. Now, Congress could have given the Fed to the power to make policy, to make environmental policy, but it hasn't done that. And so if the Fed were to do that, it would have some problems with legitimacy, right? To engage in policymaking without congressional authorization 
to do so. And I will most certainly return to this legitimacy problem as we continue. All right, so moving on, there are other things the Fed could do, right, to try and move dollars away from brown businesses and toward green ones and using in particular its regulatory authority. So I'm happy to take questions. I might not see them all the time, but I do see Michael's question. So feel free. Uh, okay, so in World War II, uh, I think they, they used 13.3 to uh, help out industries, the steel industry maybe. And I think the justification was, you know, we need the steel industry for the war. So it seems like they could take a justification like that because they did it and come up with an, a reason for why they could do it now. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of a couple of points to respond to. And sometimes I get this question about, isn't it all in how we define emergency, right? Because the Fed has these 13-3 facilities that it can roll out in times of emergency. And if climate is an emergency, right, couldn't we just do something similar to that? So I think the problem is a little bit apples and oranges, right? There's a difference between an, an ongoing present, right, emergency and one that is predicted to happen down the line. The Fed has never used its emergency liquidity facilities to, again, respond to a, an anticipated emergency. There's also language that was added to 13.3 since the 08 financial crisis that would take some of those options off the table, namely that liquidity has to be provided to the financial system. So it has to be for the purposes of solving an acute liquidity crisis in the financial system. So that's kind of sort of just like a legal barrier to doing the kind of industrial lending that I think did happen both maybe in 13.3 and also in a now repealed provision of the Federal Reserve Act that later Congresses sort of recognized, you know, we don't really want the Fed in the business of industrial lending. I could go on and on about this because it is kind of weird then that Congress asked the Fed to in fact do some industrial lending with the CARES Act, um, which is sort of a separate ball of wax. You know, but with regard to the powers, the standing powers that the Fed has in 13.3, you know, it shouldn't be on the table, both because of the way that we interpret emergency, right? If we're being sort of relatively disciplined about it, and because, you know, even you know, assuming the hypothetical emergency, you'd still need to prove a liquidity crisis in the financial system. Um, but that's a, that's a, you know, an analogy and a question that does come up a lot. Um, I see another hand, but I don't see names. So, so John, if you want to take hands, I'm fine to answer or keep going, whatever. Andy, I'll let you Andy, Andy run the show. Has a question. Maybe yes, uh, just to follow up. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, how do you see a difference between green QE and the congressional mandate to help uh, finance the uh, property market with the purchase of MBS? Not just once, but you know, two times, one during the great financial crisis and then a couple of years ago, they uh, bought the MBS and they, they've held it and they were thinking of holding it till uh, maturity at one point. And so it seems like supporting markets, particular markets, that camel's nose has gone under the tent in a sense, and that would be, in my mind, equivalent to green QE, which is very dangerous. Well, you know, people certainly take issue with the fact that the Fed buys mortgage-backed securities because it's sort of, you know, buying government debt like might be bad enough, and now you also buy agency MBS. I mean, it's the key distinction, right, is among others, but I'll start with the key distinction being that the Fed has the authorization to do that, right? So we can sort of debate whether or not there are sort of distributive impacts to that, whether or not that means that the Fed is, you know, propping up the housing market in a way that we think sort of isn't the core of monetary policy. The Fed, you know, has been given the authority to do that. So I think a better analogy would be if Congress, right, passed a revision to the Federal Reserve Act, like we saw in the UK, telling the Fed to buy green bonds. I think you'd 
you'd still have a problem because there's also a lot of subjectivity that you don't have in buying MBS, right? I mean, the Fed is buying, you know, agency MBS, but the Fed would, in the green context, have to have that additional layer of making this determination about what's green and what's brown. And I think it'd be pretty unlikely that you would see the Congress be able to specify that for the central bank. And that's, you know, my prediction is that's going to be the Achilles heel of the, you know, green mandate in the UK context, because the problem is that the government asked the Bank of England to consider sustainability in its portfolio, in its asset purchase portfolio, but it, it likewise didn't tell the bank how to sort green from brown, how to weigh the trade-offs there. And so, you know, it gave them the instruction, but it gave them the discretion to act in ways that could be perceived as political. So um, hopefully that answers your question, at least about how I'm thinking about the distinctions. Could I follow on? And, and as a mm -hmm. co-organizer, we'll, we'll give you more time in proportion to how much we wasted it in questions now. Um, but what, what stops, the, the structure was the treasury sets up a special purpose vehicle, Fed lends 90, 95% of the money of the special purpose vehicle, then the treasury is the one who decides who gets the green goodies, uh, relieving the Fed of the responsibility for doing that. That, that seems like the, the way out of your conundrum of how is the Fed going to pick who's green? Well, maybe, but that scenario that you just described to me troubles me for other reasons that I think would ultimately double back on problems for the Fed's independence. I mean, if you set up a 13-3 facility where the Fed's lending into 13-3, but then you have the Treasury picking the winners and losers, I mean, it's not unlike some of the you know, COVID facilities that you saw this year, which raise a lot of questions and concerns about the blurring of the monetary fiscal line, you know, whether you're, you know, inherently subjecting the Fed to some conversation about how those funds are being used. And you just sort of can't keep these neat separations between, you know, what is fiscal policy, what is monetary policy. And then I would sort of just, you know, uh, <laughs> well, no, we all think this is awful. It's just a question of legally <laughs> what stops them from doing it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think, you know, and this is like my, I think you'll see this a lot in the rest of the conversation, which is that there are legal questions. And I think there are some clear legal lines that we can at least establish as a baseline, right? And sort of go one level more specific than just sort of assertions about what the Fed can should and should do. But then there are also gray areas, certainly, right? There are certainly gray areas you, you sort of put your finger on one of them. And then it's not a matter of, you know, whether the law permits it. And I'll give you another example of a gray area in a second. But then it's also these sort of bigger institutional questions about, you know, what is the role of the Fed? You know, are there, you know, are there, fun, are there constitutional questions about what Congress has delegated, what it has the power to delegate? Um, what is the separation between the, the you know, the presidency and the legislature. And so I think these are all inseparable in some ways. Um, you know, another green area is with collateral requirements, right? There's a lot of discretion in the various provisions of the Federal Reserve Act around what the reserve banks can require for collateral, right? I mean, in theory, reserve banks could say, you know, no loans at the discount window unless you give me green collateral. You know, they could probably even within the letter of the law require this um, UK style pre-positioning of collateral, right? That would go even further. And another one of my predictions is that you'll, you'll start to see and hear more conversations about this kind of experimentation as people look to lean into these gray areas. And then, you know, maybe it's not so much a matter of this is clearly not lawful within the Federal Reserve Act, but, you know, is this actually what Congress contemplated when it gave you the discretion to make decisions about collateral requirements? I mean, not just green, but the whole E, S, and G, they can require to be sustainable collateral if they want to, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is a sort of infinite discretion in a lot of those collateral requirements. I mean, there have been experiments. The last experiment with, you know, this it's like, what are the, what's the expression? Old wine in new bottles. In the 1920s, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, under the leadership of Ben Strong, and I'm sure there are 
folks in the audience who know this history, right? They experimented with using, you know, an experimental use of collateral requirements to try and um, clamp down on speculative lending when there was concern about a growing stock bubble, right? And so that was you know, probably the closest we got to these sort of like value judgment use of collateral to try and to try and make something, you know, bad not happen in the economy. Um, but it was really politically unpopular. And it, it was a short lived experiment for that reason, right? So it wasn't a legal question. It was more of a rule of law question. So on that note, <laughs> I'll carry on with regulation. So, you know, leaving the land of monetary policy and thinking about the Fed with its regulatory hat on, and as I men mentioned at the outset, the big conversation here is around capital requirements. Can we incentivize banks with the carrot of more favorable capital treatment to lend to green companies? Can we deter them through the stick of higher risk weights or capital charges to not lend to brown companies. And here I think the legal markers are relatively clear too, although there are, I'm sure, plenty out there who would, maybe not in this audience, but in many audiences, um, disagree with me. But the way that I'm thinking about capital requirements is as follows. So the basis we have for increasing capital requirements in our current legal framework, the authority that the Fed had to implement the Basel III regime, it's really grounded in a particular provision of the Dodd-Frank Act that's find, found in Title I of the Act, which is all about financial stability. So the premise of raising capital requirements within this framework of Basel III is identifying a discernible financial stability risk. And that's why it's an important trigger, right, for the, if and when the Fed were to acknowledge that the, Fed, the climate change is a financial stability risk. But I think it's difficult in the specific case of the US and the US economy and the US banking sector to demonstrate that financial stability risk is tied to climate change, at least in the way that we've been using that term for the past 10 years and the way that Congress collectively understood that term when it passed Dodd-Frank. So risk to financial stability in the Dodd-Frank last 10 years sense of the word of the term comes from the notion that there is a credit risk that is lurking on big banks' balance sheets, big bank balance sheets, that if and when that risk materialized, it would so damage those bank balance sheets that their fundamental solvency would come into question. So this is, of course, what happened in 2007, 2008, in connection with residential mortgage products. But in order for that kind of Minsky type moment to result from climate change, there are a number of you know, bad things that would have to happen first that make the risk sufficiently attenuated that it would put it outside of what we would think of as an actionable financial stability risk. So to walk through the analysis, so first, the actual loans on the bank's balance sheets would have to become impaired because of climate change. And under Fed regulation, impaired has a very specific meaning. It means that the borrower cannot repay the loan in whole or in part. So that means that some kind of physical event like a storm or a storm series or a policy change that's forcing transition away from certain carbon intensive practices would have to make those borrowers unable to repay their loans to the bank in whole or in part. Now, could that happen? Well, yes, it, it could, but it's pretty unlikely if you take into account the model of bank underwriting. So banks in the US, big banks in the US, typically lend to corporates at around 50% LTV or less. So this means that there's going to have to be some event physical or policy oriented, that's so severe, so sudden, that it wipes out, say, 50% or more of these borrowers' value. Now, could that happen in a way that would actually hurt the bank balance sheet? Well, yes, but again, it seems unlikely if you factor in the structure of the bank's balance sheet and their fundamental business model. So regarding the physical risk piece of climate change, well, because the large systemically important banks in the United States are so geographically diverse by nature of their business model, any physical manifestation of climate change, like that storm series, 
would have to really suddenly transpire across multiple US and global regions at once. And I think this is actually why you see some new Fed research kind of backing away from the notion of physical risk as a financial stability risk. Now, if it's transition risk, right, if it's these legal and policy changes that we're worried are going to put certain borrowers out of business, well, that kind of policy or regulatory change, again, it would have to be so sudden and so severe that none of these carbon facing businesses could plan or adapt. So, you know, sun transitions are unlikely. They're a bit of an oxymoron, not to mention the fact that they're largely within our control. Now, ultimately, like even setting all of that aside, the key point here is that banks exposure to these carbon exposed industries, right, the, the place where we see losses accumulate the first is so small relative to their entire balance sheet that even if you assumed every one of those loans had to be written off the balance sheet, the banks would be nowhere close to insolvency. And you can readily learn this from examining banks balance sheets. So when I did this research, to give you a sense, JP Morgan's most recent quarterly report showed that its wholesale loan exposure to oil and gas and to automotive combined was only 4.6% of its balance sheet. In total figures, its equity capital was nearly three times that amount. So Citibank was at the highest end of the range. Its exposure to all energy and commodities was even still 7% of the balance sheet. Now, in absolute figures, the numbers seem really large. I mean, it's $55 billion in exposures to these industries. And when that's reported in the media or the press, it sounds tremendous. But if you compare it to the over $191 billion in tier one equity capital, it's not a huge solvency risk. And so when you look at all of the US SIPIs, they're all within that range. And some are even a little bit lower. One bank was in the 2% exposure range. So in light of these facts, you know, the question is legally, right, could a challenge to a capital rule that's premised on climate change as a financial stability risk, could it survive the Administrative Procedure Act's arbitrary and capricious standard? So here, you know, I think it's helpful to be reminded of the Financial Stability Oversight Council determination in the MetLife case. So that decision was eventually overturned on these arbitrary and capricious grounds. The court said that the analysis was too subjective, it wasn't grounded in concrete fact, and it really just suggested that the FSOC had made a hypothetical assessment of what kind of situation would materially jeopardize the stability of that institution. And that wasn't enough to onerously regulate a financial institution. And so importantly, the, that court ruling, you know, big picture dealt quite a severe blow to the FSOC's SIFI designation power that it never recovered from. So the question is, is the Fed's credibility on the line if it moves, if it rushes to adopt a climate-related capital rule? And John, I see, your, see you have your hand up. Just as a clarification on how you do this, are they also supposed to look at the capital structure of the oil and gas company? And I asked because I looked up Exxon's capital structure and discovered it was like 95% common stock. So before Exxon welches on its loans, it has to lose 95% of its value. And then the loans have to all go bad with no recovery. And then the bank has to lose. That's much different than lending to an entity that is 95% short-term debt. So are they, are they supposed to look at that buffer, that equity buffer in the target uh, business as well as their own equity buffers on the loans? Well, thank you for that additional piece of evidence to my <laughs> point, which I'll uh, incorporate in, in future uh, gathering of this empirical research. I don't, you know, they don't, they don't have to look at that. I mean, the way that the capital charges are fashioned right now is, you know, a little bit of a, of a crude measure. So all corporate exposures essentially get the same risk weight. So the move that people are trying to make is to sort of change the law so that not all corporates get the same risk weight, but that the brown companies get a higher risk weight. So I suppose in theory, you could write into that regulation that, you know, the bank regulators should consider, as you're saying, the, you know, the capital structure of the borrowers themselves, 
but given the ultimate you know goal of what that change would be <laughs> i suppose it would be unlikely unless it were likely to lead to higher capital charges and not lower capital charges but it's a great point next up is supervision right the third of the feds major functions is supervision and supervision is an incredibly important area to watch because of all of the Fed's functions, supervision is the wooliest, the most discretion bound, and so the most capable of political capture. And there are many who would argue that supervision at the Fed is supposed to be political and the vice chair for supervision is supposed to be a political player. And I think reasonable minds can disagree about that and you know what the policy outcomes of that are a separate issue. Now, supervision is, is quite interesting in the case of climate because of all of the functions. This is the place where the Fed does have the most legal room to, to maneuver, and especially on the firm level or microprudential side of things. So the Fed has the authority to do many different things in regard to all matters of credit risk, including to the extent that climate becomes folded in as another kind of credit risk. So the Fed has the authority to examine banks' underwriting practices, to keep tabs on asset quality, to inquire about risk management practices. And this all stems from quite capacious language in the Bank Holding Company Act around a bank safety and soundness. So basically what constitutes a risk to safety and soundness, what qualifies as a credit risk, those are all issues that are left to the discretion of the Fed as a microprudential supervisor. At the outer limit, as a matter of fundamental due process rights for banks, you know, it's, it's less clear what's fair to ask banks to do based on levels of uncertainty around a particular issue. And the political economy here is quite distortionary because as we know, banks are loath to actually sue or, super, um, sue or challenge their supervisors. They have very little incentive to do that. And so while there is legal authority, this is another gray area. There is some sort of rule of law related danger, which is to say that if they wanted to, Fed supervisors could use the opacity, the moral suasion of supervision to create soft deterrence on banks to lend or not lend to certain industries. Again, that may not be illegal or challenged in court as such, but it does seem antithetical to the integrity of the institution. And I'll say more on this later. So the Fed also engages in macro prudential supervision as part and parcel of its financial stability function. And the main point under discussion here in regard to climate change is stress testing. So climate change doesn't really fit well within existing stress tests, both as a policy matter or a legal matter. And that's because stress tests like the DFAST, which was fashioned from Dodd-Frank, or the CCAR, which has its legal authority in the Bank Holding Company Act, they're both really about modeling banks' capital position, assuming that there's some exogenous shock that generates recession-like conditions. And both of these tests are statutorily tied to the capital planning process. So the Fed could certainly innovate a climate scenario, so long as it generates those recession-like conditions. There's no legal barrier there. There's no requirement about what kinds of scenarios the Fed comes up with. But doing so might not change anything, right? It might not change anything in terms of the bank's capital requirements, given the nature of the exposures and how small they are in the balance sheet, as we just, as I just discussed a moment ago. So then the question has moved on to, well, what about inventing a new stress test, a scenario analysis, an exploratory exercise along the lines of what the Bank of England has done? Now, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC's recent report is certainly pressing in this direction for a scenario analysis that's much more exploratory, open-ended in nature. Lael Brainerd has said that she believes scenario analysis would be a very useful tool. And you know, in one of her more recent speeches, she really applauds what the UK and the ECB are doing in terms of these new scenario analyses. 
But again, sort of, it isn't clear that the Fed has legal authority to do that. And it's worth considering, since the comparison has been drawn, the very different frameworks that the Bank of England and the ECB are operating under. So let's think about the Bank of England. So Section A, or Section 2A of the Bank of England Act gives the bank an explicit financial stability objective. It has an explicit financial stability mandate. And in regard to the Financial Policy Committee, it also gives the FPC, like it gave the MPC, this secondary mandate to have regard to the government's economic goals. And the government of the UK has stated that it has a green finance strategy, and that strategy is to make sure that the financial system is ready and willing, it's able to facilitate the delivery of the UK's carbon targets and clean growth. So again, as in the monetary policy corollary, the 2021 remit letter to the FPC specifically and especially refers to climate change. So, you know, what does that comparison make clear? Well, a couple of things. So in the UK, the central bank is the macro prudential authority expressly by statute. And that's not the case in the US. Congress gave that job to another agency. It gave that job to the FSAC. Also, the Bank of England, the FPC, has an explicit mandate to pursue financial stability. The Fed doesn't actually have an explicit financial stability mandate at all. It's just been sort of inferred from history and the Dodd-Frank Act, and I'll say more about the financial stability mandate in a little bit. So given the different legislative action and intent, you know, it's arguable that the Fed just doesn't have as much legal room to develop an entirely new supervisory burden on the banking sector without legislative instruction like Congress did when it put the DFAS in the Dodd-Frank Act. Or at the very least, the need to create a new regulatory rule that goes through notice and comment rulemaking and allows banks to be heard on the issue. So if the Fed were to go ahead with scenario analysis, and it's not just Governor Brainerd, apparently when Powell testified to the House, he also said that it was on the table. I would think that it would have to be pretty straightforward and not add too much of a supervisory burden to be consistent with the Administrative Procedure Act. But we'll see. That's still very much under discussion. So having traversed the terrain of the various Fed's mandates and its function, you know, we need to take a step back and ask, what is the goal here? If the goal is to have the Fed be able to react to macroeconomic emergencies that could be caused by climate change, to deal with macroeconomic malaise in the broad economy that could be caused by climate change, or to monitor asset quality and exposures, well, the Fed has those authorities already. But if we wanted to go more of a European or UK route to try and affirmatively make the financial system greener using the Fed's policy tools, Congress would really need to legislate. Otherwise, we'd be changing the role of the central bank, which would create a number of institutional problems for the Fed. So in my remaining time here, and I think you had uh, credited me a few minutes back during the Q&A, I want to walk you through sort of five you know, categories of difficulties, problems, you know, institutional dilemmas that the Fed will or one day soon confront if it continues to go down this path. And the first has to do with, as we sort of started discussing earlier, the blurring of the line between monetary and fiscal and the changing of the nature of the relationship between the Fed and the Treasury. The second is specific to the financial stability mandate itself and whether there's some danger of that mandate becoming bloated and what that means for the future role of the Fed. The third has to do with maintaining the integrity of the democratic process and what it means to end run Congress in this situation. The fourth draws on sort of implications for the legitimacy of the Fed. And then finally, I'll end with a note on sort of what, how we want to use our central bank in US society. So in regard to the potential erosion that's already underway in some regard, I think, between monetary and fiscal policy, you know, the point here is that if the central bank starts to allocate credit to different sectors of the economy or lean in to try and impact the flow of, of credit to certain sectors, it does look like fiscal policy. It's credit policy. 
And you know, why is that bad? At various points in history, the Fed has done things that look a little bit like credit policy. But this is sort of a, you know, a Paul Tucker point that unelected central bankers should not be making subjective value judgments. When Treasury does credit policy, we can hold the president accountable. When Congress passes tax laws, we can hold Congress accountable. But like the Supreme Court of the United States, the Fed suffers from a democratic deficit. So if and when the Fed exercises its judgment in place of democratically responsive institutions, you know, at best it's distortionary in the economy, but at worst, I think it opens the door to having the president or the treasury secretary try to influence the Fed's monetary policy in other cases because that barrier is breached again and again. So an illustration on this same point, I think, is really useful. And we can think about the FSOC and what's been transpiring with the FSOC and climate in the Fed in the past year or so. So again, Title I, Financial Stability of Dodd-Frank created the Financial Stability Oversight Council, is a new interagency council of regulators. It's helmed by the Treasury Secretary, and it has a couple of key powers. One of its powers, which is used now more so than ever since the designation power is sort of on the back burner, is the power to make recommendations to member regulatory agencies, and this includes the Fed, in regards specifically to financial stability risks. So at the time, I think the implications for Fed independence went largely remarked upon, but in creating and empowering the FSOC in this way, essentially we affected a dialing back of the tradition against the treasury influencing Fed decision-making that has been in place at least since the Fed Treasury Accord. So consider how it's been playing out in regard to climate change. So in, tw in 2021, President Biden issued an executive order requiring this whole of government approach to fighting climate change. And it directed the Treasury as Treasury Secretary, as chair of the FSOC, to both assess the financial stability risks of climate change and also to issue a report to the president that's, that was outlining all of the ways that the FSOC member agencies were integrating considerations of climate in their policy and programs. So in response to that, the FSOC wrote its report and it made recommendations. It used its power of recommendation to recommend to the Fed that it adopt a range of supervisory practices in regard to climate change. Now, the question is whether the subtext, the soft law around this recommendation is that Fed supervision should effectively aim to deter banks from lending to brown companies and encourage them to develop underwriting practices to favor green borrowers instead. So it begs the question that if this mechanism works in that way, if the effort is successful, is the result that the FSOC is an avenue for the president to influence the allocation of credit in the economy toward politically favored sectors and away from politically disfavored ones, all while using the veneer of independence, technocracy, and neutrality of the Federal Reserve. So moving on to the point about the financial stability mandate, you know, the question to consider here is what kind of precedent we're setting for the breadth of the financial stability mandate. So to be sure, the Fed has always had a financial stability role. And classically, financial stability was about individual bank soundness and economic stability, especially in times of acute financial distress. But I would say since 2010, we've had this new kind of financial stability role asserted for the Fed that seems much more like an all-purpose catch-all tool for things that perhaps the president doesn't like in the economy. So if the mandate is not cabined at all in terms of the hypothetical characteristics of the risk or the time horizon of a potential financial stability risk, the question is, can anything be a candidate for the Fed's financial stability dossier? And how is society, let alone the Fed, going to draw those lines? So related to this, I think there are a distinct number of very concrete rule of law problems in this scenario where the Fed can take up new problems under the heading of financial stability risk. So for one, as I alluded to earlier, there's an end run around Congress here, which is democratically illegitimate. Climate change poses questions that are polarizing 
There isn't really a social consensus about what the state should do, and certainly not about what the Fed should do. And if there were, then Congress would pass new laws giving the Fed goals to tackle climate change, but it hasn't. Now, second, it suggests that if Congress is inert, the Fed can just respond to the president's wishes in the interest of expedience. But this is a very slippery slope that we could slide down here. So if you give the Fed the power to identify new financial stability risks, again, with no limitations, the question is, what's going to fall into that bucket? And is it ripe for political abuse from presidents of all parties? Paul, I see a hand from you. Um, so the, the question I have is, haven't we already gone down this slippery slope of uh, conceding power to the executive branch? Um, this has been going on for maybe a hundred years and accentuated at, at a, it's a, a much more rapid uh, shift of powers in the, say the last um, 25 to 30 years. So, um, you know, this is part of a long-term trend that the executive branch be, has become the dominant power in the political system. And the only way it really could be stopped is through court action. And so you'd have to have a, a Supreme Court that would really be willing to step into this. And it, it, are the courts really going to feel qualified to um, move into uh, financial matters and monetary matters? It, it, my guess is they're going to see this as outside their area of competence. So what do you, I mean, I don't see any way of your ideas becoming effective other than through court action. Do you think that's really plausible? Well, you could always put me on the Supreme Court. No, seriously, I, um, I'm so glad you asked me this question um, because we were just chatting before the seminar officially got started. I agree with you 100% on both points, and you've given me a little opportunity to talk about my other papers here. I have a very long law review paper, which isn't up on SSRN, but I would be delighted to share it with anyone that's interested, that I call the monetary executive. And it discusses exactly what you just laid out. This evolution that I pinpointed starting during the FDR administration in 1933 with the Great Depression of Congress delegating in this sort of ad hoc but successive way an increasing sort of cache of monetary and fiscal powers to the presidency so that we've moved so far from our constitutional baseline where the framers of the constitution were very specific in delegating monetary and fiscal powers to congress and assuming that congress would jealously guard those powers and over time and in response to emergency largely prolonged emergencies often congress has empowered the presidency. So I think you're right that in some ways, you know, this is sort of flying under the radar because we've all just sort of been, you know, grown up in this constitutional culture where the presidency does have a lot of power in this space. Nonetheless, I think, you know, once it starts to impact the Fed, right, and becoming sort of more blatant and transparent in the way that we use the central bank, sort of the, you know, bastion of independence to, you know, serve the president's priorities, you know, socially, as a matter of sort of democratic legitimacy, I'm not sure that the system can continue. And I think there are a lot of negative implications for this, you know, monetary executive, as I'm calling it for shorthand, that range from, you know, the soundness of the currency to just sort of unforced policy error. And I, and you know, normally, as you say, you know, I said in the second part of your question, I mean, if you think about checks and balances, you know, if Congress is the one engaging in these delegations, then you would think that the, you know, Article three would provide the check, right, in judicial review. Normally, when there's, you know, over delegation or agency overreach, we assume that the courts are going to check that overreach. And the and the problem is that courts largely either don't want to handle monetary policy decisions or oftentimes their decisions you know are feel very politically motivated i mean if you look over the course of history you see this pattern where the supreme court and the courts of appeals either say 
it's not non justiciable because it's a political question, as they do a lot with the Fed and monetary policy challenges, or you know they feel that because we've arrived at this sort of monetary arrangement that's untenable to reverse course from, they have no choice but to sort of, you know, bless it with some sort of contorted constitutional reasoning. So, you know, I suppose this is a paper that I need to write, and I've been thinking about it a lot, because ultimately the question is, why is our judicial review broken in this space? And what could we you sort of do with the courts to improve it? So I guess it's just a, a long way of saying, I think that you're right. And I largely agree with you. <laughs> could I just follow up on that one? We don't just need the courts. I mean, if Congress, especially after next yeah. November, says what the hell is going on and drags everybody into congressional hearings, even if they can't pass legislation, that would seem to be a mighty powerful uh, correction before somebody sues and it has to go all the way to the Supreme Court. Absolutely, absolutely. I started my last, you know, my last slide is basically, you know, I have three tips for Congress about how you can start to chip away at the problem because, right, I mean, Congress would be the first stop in really, you know, basic matters about the way it delegates power to the Fed. So yes, um, another registering my agreement also. Um, Michael? Maybe you could conclude because there's a few other questions that are coming. So if you could conclude, then we can wrap up. Thank you. Sure. Do you want? Okay. So, should I wrap up with the slides and then? Yeah, wrap up because there's several okay. people who have questions. Sure. Sure. No problem. Okay. So, all right. I have a point about legitimacy here, which we can come back to later because it's a different point altogether and sort of an empirical question. And you know, the the final point that I think is worth really driving home is that you know, as I started off and talking about sort of tip of the iceberg, I think. Climate is a bit of a Pandora's box for reshaping the role of the central bank in US society because it does signal a tremendous path of growth for the central bank. And there are a number of significantly important economic issues that have not historically been allocated to the central bank to devise monetary, regulatory, or supervisory solutions for. You know, we can think about the economic impacts of trade or immigration or our relationships with China, as we've all seen the line between national security and economic security is, is very thin. And you know, there's a lot at stake in scrutinizing the question when we think about how big of a role we want for the state in terms of the Fed to have in controlling the direction of the economy. So as I promised, I'll wrap up with my three quick tips for Congress. And as John was saying, you know, Congress, as much as the Fed or the other actors here deserve some admonition to be restrained in the way that it delegates power to the Fed. So, you know, in regard to the Fed's mandates, many of the Fed's mandates are broad delegations. So if the Fed is going, if the Congress is going to delegate broadly to the Fed, it also needs to pair that with really robust oversight. The Fed the Congress should also stop uh, thinking about adding mandates to the Fed, right? The more mandates that the Fed is given or the more leeway it has in interpreting its mandates, the more likely it is to introduce this opportunity for political influence and an un unbound discretion at the Fed itself. So I'll stop there and um, turn it over for, for more questions. Let me stop my screen share. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so Ken Jett had a question, but his mic isn't working, so I'll paraphrase it. He says, macro is so sloppy anyway. How can you possibly deliver these more specific things in the area of climate change? It's sort of a maybe defeatist question, but reflects the reality that's out there. So any, any quick reaction to that? I guess, you know, again, I just probably agree. I mean, I think the, the point uh, the point where we may overlap is that, you know, I think the Fed is already under a lot of pressure to be a bit more disciplined and how it does monetary policy, at least in terms of sort of articulating a strategy and then explaining deviations from the strategy. And this goes to the very last point that I made, that the more things we ask the Fed to do, the more like a rudderless ship it's going to be, especially because inevitably its various mandates and goals are going to conflict. Okay, now one other question that came from the chat. Uh, Scott Frame was about, there's, there's rumors that capital requirements will be adjusted for green versus brown firms. And maybe that's the, that's something to look at as well. Is that is that an issue as well? 
sorry, was the question, how would they be adjusted? Yeah, yes. Well, I think that's, I think the question belies the problem, which is to say it's not clear how in an, in an objective way one could, you know, adjust capital requirements for green versus brown firms because it's not a straightforward answer to just look at a company and say you're green or you're brown, right? You can take a company like ExxonMobil, for example, and say that they're brown, but you'd have to really do a deep analysis to understand how it's planning to use its R&D, you know, whether it's planning to, you know, if it was, a, you know, real assets, how a brown building might be planning to renovate to implement new green technology. So it's hard to see how any sort of relatively information insensitive capital rule could be implemented in this scenario in a way that isn't distortionary, which is why I don't have a lot of faith in capital requirements for this purpose. Okay, thank you. I think uh, you know, Mike Boskin's next. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry, trying to get the mute off. And apologies if you answered this, I was teaching until a half hour ago, so I, I missed the first part of the talk. It seems to me we already have seen one problem in this genre, which is um, the pressure to do something about inequality at the Fed. Uh, this has been going on for a long time with very rules about lending and stuff like that. But um, but the idea that it should keep running an economy that's really, really hot to get unemployment really low because that gets wages rising at the bottom more rapidly from historical experience and gets minority unemployment way down. Seems to me that uh, the more of these kinds of things we pile on the Fed, the more likely they're gonna be contradictory and cause serious problems, including the people they're trying to help. Um, and you can imagine um, going the opposite direction. You could imagine an extreme populist um, national security hawk trade warrior president down the road saying, well, you know, what are you doing with swap lines to foreign central banks in the midst of a crisis? Why, why are you funding a company? Why, why is a bank you supervise funding a company that invests in China or in uh, some other country, et cetera? So there's legitimate national security concerns, et cetera. But the problem is without sort of, as you're indicating, without some sort of clearer guidance, everything from 13-3 exigency to national security crises to imagine markets are about to blow up and everybody will die. Uh, it seems to me that we're just inviting so much discretion with so little guidance that we've gotten a situation where every time we have a so-called or legitimate crisis, we're expanding these, creating more moral hazard. They're used more readily in the next time around. And at some point, all that's going to have to stop before we're going to pay a very, very high price. So I'm, I'm supportive of your general idea, but I don't look at it just to climate. I, I, I try to look at it symmetrically that there could be nutty things to get in the way of their uh, financial stability or, or uh, preventing a deep recession. Mandates. Yeah, I, I mean, I love questions that I can agree with. And I realized I was thinking about the time wrong. I'm sorry if I was rushing to answer the other questions. I realize now we have 15 more minutes. Um, I think that's exactly right, which is to say, you know, the, the slippery slope problem is, you know, climate change is a an interesting case study because it's sort of the first big way that we've seen the Fed, you know, pushed outside of its lane. But you can imagine any number of issues that could be, you know, characterized as financial stability risk and, you know, what would be the limiting principle. And as you correctly suggest, I mean, there will be pendulum swings because presidents, administrations of both parties will perceive financial stability risks in different ways. And the executive branch will have different priorities and to the you know the moment that the fed starts to be in service of the you know big issue for the administration i think that's a problem right today it's you know green bonds it could be you know build the wall bonds it could be you know anything and the the point is that we have to be principled about what the role of the central bank is right i, I mean i would like to think this isn't you know a, a political statement it's really just a statement about the way that our central bank is supposed to function that's consistent with our democratic values. So yes, I, I agree. Uh, so Jeff Lacker. Yeah, so 34 years ago, I think this is important work. 34 years ago, Bob King and the late Marvin Goodfriend argued that 
uh, the central bank should uh, husband, uh, you know, uh, stockpile its political, scarce political capital and use it for the defense of uh, itself when it had to take unpopular actions to control inflation. So you might not think that this might ha has a direct connection to inflation, you know, in sort of a mechanical sense, but in some sense it might. I have sort of an ominous parallel that, that keep, has been haunting me lately. The Fed was given the authority to buy MBS in late 1966 after raising rates to try and control the incipient inflation that was rising then caused a crunch in the housing market because they didn't raise rate Q. Congress inserted it. Um, it was William Proxmire leading the charge and pushed the Fed. The Fed was really reluctant, pushed the Fed to actually buy MBS. They did some RPs at first. Finally, under Burns, they caved. Later, in, in the late 70s, a subcommittee of the FOMC under Paul Volcker, then head of the New York Fed, uh, reviewed their holdings of agency securities, which turned out to include uh, the, the debt of uh, the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. So the, the Fed actually helped finance the Washington Metro, it turned out. He was sort of aghast at what was in there. And over the course of his tenure, the Fed started rolling off all of these things and rolling out of it. So you, you can look at this as a coincidence that the loss of the Fed's credibility and the restoration of it cor corresponded with them getting into and out of housing finance uh, debt. And whether we're seeing a similar dynamic now with respect to these other issues or not um, bothers me. Yeah, no, that's an interesting, right. I mean, so that's an interesting piece of history. And as you were talking, I was thinking about the conditions for the Fed's legitimacy and credibility. And at the end, you sort of said how the Fed's credibility waxes and wanes with it getting in and out of these various programs. And I think that's a really important point. So when I sort of think theoretically about the conditions for the Fed's legitimacy of its policy decisions, you know, one of the conditions is that the Fed does have some elasticity in its in its powers, and I and I guess maybe it's more relevant to things like quantitative easing, right, where there aren't a lot of cons like legal constraints around the timing, the duration, the scope of QE. So it all comes down to the Fed's internal governance, and you know it it's sort of establishing rules for when it buys certain assets and when it doesn't and using self-restraint to maybe do it when it's necessary or when Congress asks it to, you know, in your example or in the CARES Act example, but then also being restrained enough to back away from that when its credibility is on the line or when it's no longer necessary. Um, Elena Pestorino and then Andrew Ullman. Elena? Thank you, Apollo. This my video is not working. Christina, I very much enjoyed your talk. I have a curiosity about your feeling in terms of whether the time has come for a redesign or clarification of the mandate. The discuss these discussions we are having within uh, corners of the ECB has been framed in terms of the ambiguity of the price stability mandate. After all, climate change amounts to long-run financial risks. So is an our job as the SCB tackling it ahead of time for once. But then the question is that we create a certain level of discretions by which different policymakers and different policy, uh, monetary policy authorities interpret the mandate as Michael Boskin was talking about, even the employment mandate in different ways that in a way please or support a certain view, fiscal and monetary view of the world. But of course, it's very delicate because redesigning the mandate is it's a big action. But aren't in a way aren't we in a way back to discussing the trade-off between discretions and rules and where do you stand on this debate? Thank you. Yeah. No. Thanks for your thanks for your question. And I have been following sort of the <laughs> the political difficulty with the price stability mandate and the ECB also and. I understand that there isn't a huge appetite to rely on the secondary mandate because it seems <laughs> to be conceding the fact that climate change wouldn't then be falling under the price stability mandate in the first instance. And you know, I think your question is a really, really important one, which is, 
to the extent that discretion in the mandates, which there is, opens the door to potential political abuses, what exactly is the solution? Because at the other end of the spectrum, it's also potentially very problematic to bind the hands of a central bank in making the mandate narrower because legislatures can't possibly foresee you know, all of the emergencies or economic conditions down the road. And, you know, I think where I come down on it, on it personally, you know, people have proposed lots of different ways. Like one way to go is the European way of, or the bank way, I guess, of having the government specify what is price stability. Another way is having Congress exactly. you know, specific in, you know, articulating, this is what we mean. These are your targets, you know, in terms of structuring the price stability mandate. And then a third way, which I think I favor the most is having the, having the Fed do it. Right, having the you know holding the Fed's or central banks you know feet to the fire in articulating a strategy, if not you know sticking to a, a rule. I, I know there's lots of you know opportunity to have conversation about monetary rules in this room, but you know if it's not a rule, it has to be at least a strategy, something that's articulated ex ante, right? That is more specific than you know make it up as we go. So that when there are deviations from the strategy, at least the public can see that there is in fact a default and there's a mechanism, a governance mechanism for departing from that default and explaining it to the public and to legislatures. And so I think that's the way that I think would best balance the need for discretion and the problems with discretion on the other hand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So confining basically your suggestion, which I will report, is, is confining the control on the discretion within the purview and, and the space of the monetary authorities themselves. Exactly, right. And having the monetary authorities demonstrate that their discretion isn't unbounded, right? That they're using their discretion in specific ways in specific periods of time. But then, you know, having that articulation serve as the basis for you know, greater tools of accountability from the legislature, right? Because Thank I think you. it's difficult for the legislator to hold the central bank accountable if they <laughs> don't know what they're supposed right. to Right, and for. their desires. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andrew Ullman, Andrew? Yes, yeah, so actually to follow up on that, it seems like a logical conclusion to, to your arguments here in your paper, which is, is that not only is a mandate important, which I think, you know, many people on this call have been arguing for a long time, but uh, to actually make it effective, there needs to be, uh, they need to be accompanied by a certain standing requirement for, for litigation. Because as you also noted here, when it came typically on the supervisory area, those entities that most likely have standing to potentially challenge a, uh, a deviation from a mandate, a violation of a statutory authority, oftentimes are in a position where it's very difficult for them to exercise such rights. And that whether or not there would be a need for a broader standing. And now, normally, you know, one, just, and I'm just going to throw those out there. Normally, I would suspect you would be skeptical of kind of general public standing for for loss for for litigation. You know, has your research caused you to think more broadly about the appropriateness potentially in this area for a, sta a broader standing requirement than otherwise might be uh, might be appropriate in public policy contexts? Yeah, thanks. Hi, Andrew. I so I I think for certainly for super so for monetary policy, yes, probably. I mean, I think it goes broader than the Fed. It goes to a wide range of monetary actions. But in respect of your question around supervision, I agree that it's really important and should be a priority of the Fed and the vice chair for supervision to make it more accessible for the financial institutions to be able to adjudicate supervisory challenges, whether it's a standing requirement or whether it's something that the Fed innovates it itself. I mean, when Randy Quarles was the vice chair, he was experimenting with ideas about how to have, you know, agency review within the Fed of supervisory determinations that then sort of consistent with the way that other regulatory agencies do so, right, could then be appealed to the DC circuit or what have you. So I do think that that would have been a helpful sort of, again, constraining device or account an accountability mechanism, right, to hold supervisors accountable for their decisions. And I'm guessing that's going to die on the vine, but I do agree with you that there should be a path and not a stigmatized path for being able to 
have a back and forth about the meets and bounds of supervisory determinations, particularly as we go further afield from what we would have classically thought about in terms of credit risk. So uh, Mike Bordo, I look, uh, John Cochran took his hand down. So Mike Bordo, then we're done. Okay, so I was, I'm thinking about this in a, in a slightly different way, but I'm really not that far from Jeff Lacker, Jack, Jeff Lacker and Elena. So in, in less developed countries, the central bank is the only competent game in town. And so it does everything, okay? In advanced countries, um, you have a division of labor based on efficiency. And so the question is, what do you do when some new perceived problem comes along? Who deals with it? Well, you know, that's the question of, of where you, you draw the line. And it's usually the weakest link that ends up doing it. And so like the framers, when they thought of the fit, I mean, they, 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 they gave it a well-defined mandate so that you wouldn't cross the line with the central bank. Okay, but then the question is, what happens if the, the conditions change behind the mandate, right? Gold standard's gone, real bills doesn't work. Okay, then what do you do? And that's, that's, that's where, the, where the problems start coming along. And if you look at the history of the Fed, and we, we always think of it in terms of evolution, but this is, this is the issue, it's like, you, you know, you can draw a line somewhere, but that line is pretty hard to define as time, as time comes along and the world changes. Yes, yes. So I, I liked your opening statement about um, games in town. I think it was, was it Mervyn King that said if central banks are the only game in town I'm getting out of town? Um, someone, <laughs> someone smart said it. And I thought you were going in a different direction with your question, so I'll come back to it. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, right. The Federal Reserve Act was created in a world where, you know, the framers of the Fed didn't think that the Fed would really have all that much to do actively in terms of regulating the supply of credit and money. And then, you know, as you say, real bills went away and, you know, fast forward, you know, gold standard is gone and then we have a fiat currency. And I, you know, agree when we're talking about the balance sheet. I mean, a lot of the difficulties that you run into stem from the fact that we have a fiat currency, but the Federal Reserve Act hasn't evolved yeah. to include any constraints on right. the extent to which the Fed can increase the money supply. Right. So I agree entirely with you. And if I had a couple shots at revising the Federal Reserve Act, I'd probably you know, focus there first. Um, and so that sort of goes back to the, you know, the the congressional point, you know, and as much as Congress has <clears throat> trouble when it delegates too much, it, you know, also needs to probably think about making some modifications to the Federal Reserve Act and in a, in a really serious way, right? I mean, Congress is always sort of tinkering about different provisions of the Federal Reserve Act, but to sort of fundamentally think about what the power and the opportunity the Fed has now in the economy and the monetary system that we have, the two aren't completely synced up. And so that probably is an issue. And then going back to what I thought you were going to ask me, I think there is a, an important sort of institutional landscape point to make that I didn't really get to in the talk, but it is also this comparative point, which is that in other countries, the central bank is you know, is the only game in town, or at least one of the only games in town. So it may well be that other societies, you know, want and need their central banks to do things that we have other institutions, you know, capable of doing and some that are, you know, more democratically responsive because they're closer to the presidency or what have you. So I think that's also an important point when we're thinking about these questions about, well, if the bank is, the Bank of England is doing or the ECB is doing it, why is the Fed being so slow or sluggish? And it's a complicated institutional answer. Catherine, you want to wrap it up? I was going to sort of ask a question, which I'll try to do very quickly as a form of wrap up, because I disagree with Mike. This is not about how do you solve a new problem? What institution solves the problem? The problem being solved is there's a political group that wants a climate policy, which focuses around strangling fossil fuels before alternatives are at scale. If they try to pass that through Congress, the pe peasants which pe with pitchforks will be out in the streets and they can't get it. 
So what do you do? You sneak it into the regulatory process. It's a subversion of democracy. It's not, we, it's not a society that can't, can't solve this problem by other ways. And the sign is wrong. Uh, you know, Tesla's price earnings ratio is 1,000. Exxon's is about 20. Uh, as Mike, Mike Boskin pointed out, this is just the Community Reinvestment Act all over again. Once you do massively subsidized, central bank subsidized lending, government subsidized lending, uh, highly leveraged uh, politically popular industries, you're creating the next bubble. If you were honest at all about the sign, where is the da financial danger of climate risk? It's in all the highly subsidized new things living off of government subsidies, not in the, in the legacy, uh, legacy parts. Now, maybe as a question, how can you sue when the Fed is so obviously in fantasy land and, and making up things when the sign is evidently completely wrong? Yes. Okay. Gosh, I was going to, well, we're out of time. So I could try and join your two comments, but maybe we'll do it offline. So to answer your question directly, how do you, how do you sue? Well, I mean, look, with monetary policy things and the things that, you know, Mike Bordo was talking about, I think that is hard to challenge, you know, and that's a problem. But with regulation, you know, it's not that hard to sue if the Fed creates a capital rule, right? That can be challenged that can certainly be challenged under the APA in court as in theory could supervisory decisions, but they have to be formal enforcement actions. And the Fed likes to do a lot of informal actions which are difficult to sue in court. So I think the, the clearest way you could sue is in the way that you're talking about, right? If there's a firm regulation that's actually promulgated pursuant to the APA. But, you know, apropos of your comment, you know, if the Fed really wants to do this and knows that it's unlikely to stand up in court, then it has plenty of ways to, you know, accomplish green goals while circumventing judicial review, namely not using the notice and comment rulemaking, using supervisory guidance, using informal supervisory determinations, and, you know, using things like collateral requirements. All of those things would largely be insulated from judicial review. <laughs> Ms. Peter, thank you so much. You, you generated a lot of fascinating questions and your answers were terrific. So thanks for joining us. Uh, come back again. Well, thanks yeah. for thanks, having Christina. me. Bye everyone. Have a good afternoon. Be well.